Last year, a federal court unanimously ruled that the Republican legislature in South Carolina had engaged in illegal racial gerrymandering, diluting the power of the state's black voters. But today, the Supreme Court reversed that decision. Writing for the majority, Justice Alito argued that the courts must give South Carolina Republicans the benefit of the doubt when they say that race had nothing to do with how they drew the congressional maps. Quoting from Alito's opinion, when a federal court finds that race drove a legislature's districting decisions, it is declaring that the legislature engaged in offensive and demeaning conduct that bears an uncomfortable resemblance to political apartheid. We should not be quick to hurl such accusations at the political branches. In other words, it's pretty offensive to accuse South Carolina Republicans of racism, so let's not. And if there's no racism, then there's nothing to see here, folks. But if Alito's decision seemed absurd and also extreme, another Reagan administration alum, a man by the name of Clarence Thomas, took this all one step further. In his concurring opinion, Justice Thomas argued that the federal judiciary should have no role in settling disputes about any election maps. And then he called into question a half century of precedent following from the court's landmark decision in Brown v. Board of Education. I mean, hey, why not? Abortion, affirmative action, voting rights, all of them already on the chopping block. Why not go for desegregation, too? This is what it looks like when you fill government with political zealots. The administration may end, but the people do not necessarily go away. They just become the next generation of serious people, experienced enough for a confirmation hearing and young enough for a lifetime appointment. Joining me now is Ari Berman, national voting rights correspondent at Mother Jones. He is also the author of the new book, Minority Rule, the right-wing attack on the will of the people and the fight to resist it. Also joining me is Dahlia Lithwick, Slate's senior editor, writing about the courts and the law. Thank you both for joining me on this, well, monumental day, um, and, and, and gravely so. Ari, first, just let's talk, let's talk about the project here. I mean, we did not get to this moment by chance, and there's a reason I wanted to retrace everything happening in the Reagan 80s. This is a multi-decade project on the part of the right. I was having PTSD from reliving my last book and then going into my, my new one I'm because sorry for that. this is history that's very familiar to me, which is that the conservative movement specifically put people that were opposed to the civil rights movement, opposed to voting rights, opposed to these policies in positions of power to do things through the courts that they knew they could not do through the normal political process. They would not have been able to get rid of the Voting Rights Act, overturn Roe v. Wade through the normal political process. So they said, let's stack the courts. Let's construct an anti-democratic court that will then do all these anti-democratic things that we can't do through the normal political process. And we're seeing this decades-long strategy play out today where they're accomplishing all the things they wanted. They are overturning Roe v. Wade. They are gutting the Voting Rights Act to such a point that it's barely effective. And this didn't happen by chance. Basically, the conservative movement has made the courts their test case for minority rule because they know that the court, at least in their hopes, will be insulated from political accountability. And certainly the way the justices are acting, they feel like they are insulated from political accountability. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, this week of all weeks, Dahlia, when we find out that Justice Alito has uh, flags uh, bearing the hallmark of the insurrectionist movement flying above more than one of his homes, here he is again, again, going against the will of the people, the will of our sort of democratic process to undermine voting rights. What is your reaction to the decision today? Yeah, I mean, I think your point is the right one, Alex, which is that these are both stories of minority rule and a complete lack of accountability. And I really want to make one more pitch to folks who are listening that these are the same story, that we tend to sort of talk about, you know, Alito, malfeasance, weird behavior, upside down flags as a kind of a one story, and then the doctrine that comes out of the court as another. And they are so intrinsically connected because they are both stories of what it is to create a judiciary that is so utterly, utterly protected from uh, public dis 
disdain, public displeasure from the sense that they are subverting democracy as we know it. And I think both the decision today and Justice Alito's public comic conduct, where he's just flouting every single ethics and sort of appearance constraint, they are of a piece. They are both stories of what it is to be utterly untouchable in this moment. Um, this is going to have implications and beyond the conservative project. There's the immediate impact on our elections and how we have a, a representative democracy or not. Ari, this is happening in South Carolina, but how do you see this decision echoing across other states? Well, you're right. I mean, what it does is it gives Republicans another House seat and the House is going to be very close. So every seat matters. And they also ran out the clock in this case in the way that they're doing with the immunity case, because a lower court was already forced to basically say Republicans can keep this district, even though they called it a stark racial gerrymander. Then and the Supreme Court, of course, went further, and now they're making it very difficult to challenge racial gerrymandering in the future. And if I can just contextualize this for a second, they've already gutted the Voting Rights Act twice. Right. So they've already ripped the heart of the Voting Rights Act. They have also said that partisan gerrymandering cannot be challenged in federal court, which is absolutely insane. You could draw a map where one party gets 30 percent of the votes, 70 percent of the seats, and they'll say, can't even challenge it, let alone strike it down. So racial gerrymandering is really the, one of the only things you can still challenge in federal court when it comes to voting rights. Now they're saying basically racial gerrymandering is going to be a lot harder to challenge, too, because essentially what Alito's saying, let's give the benefit of the doubt to the people that are doing the discriminating, yes. as opposed to those who are facing who discrimination. Are fighting it. And this is a very consistent theme from the court. Their sympathies lie with people that are suppressing votes, diluting votes, making it harder to vote, as opposed to those people that are facing those obstacles to voting. Would you say, Dahlia, that there's inherent... I mean, I'm not asking this rhetorically. I am actually asking this. There's, there, in, in saying that the race has nothing to do with this, they are also just revealing the racial agenda that they operate within and under. Is that, is that, is that unfair? Because nine times out of ten, these justices, with the exception of one ruling earlier this year, are always going with the white people. Right. This is like a layer cake of gaslighting, Alex. I mean, there's so many levels of, you know, we're just trying to be fair. We're just going to defer to the legislature. We're just going to say that whatever the rules are for finding error in the district court finding, there's extensive, extensive findings from the lower court, the three judge panel, you know, the, the Alito just bats away. Eh, there's no there. I don't find any of this to be indicative of, uh, you know, a, a, a racial gerrymander. So there's just layers and layers and layers of denialism. And maybe the cherry on top, although there's so many cherries on top of this cake, is when Justice Alito literally tells Justice Kagan that an opinion that she wrote that stands for the opposite proposition in 2017, that his opinion is actually truer to that than hers. And when she says in her dissent, like, no, you've just completely subverted everything I wrote, he's like, Oh, honey, listen to me. So there's just every single check that was supposed to protect disadvantaged racial minorities from having their power suppressed over centuries. Every one of those checks is batted away under the theory that this was never a problem. It's certainly not a problem now. I, I, as chilling as all of the, the writing in this uh, this opinion, the Sam Alito's opinion is, all right, there's Clarence Thomas's. Um, oh can occur yeah, exactly. That, as, if, as if anyone needed to be more fearful of where we're headed as a country. He's basically suggesting Brown v. Board of Education has no, there's, there's nothing that should really follow from that. It has no teeth. We shouldn't be involved in the, 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 the courts should not be in, involved in this business. I mean, reminder, Clarence Thomas was put on the court to replace Thurgood Marshall. Yeah. I mean, the irony and um, the, the, the sort of democratic alarm bells that should be ringing. Do you, how did you read that opinion? How yeah, we were joking Thomas's about position? what's the silver lining here, and we said at least no one joined Thomas's concurrence. <laughs> I mean, because he, he literally wants to repeal the 20th century. Yes. I and mean, that's what he's trying to do here. I mean, throwing shade at Brown versus Board of Education on the 70th anniversary of that decision, saying he wants to overturn the one-person, one-vote rulings, which... Earl Warren said were the most important rulings of that court, saying that you can't challenge racial gerrymandering or vote dilution ever, which would basically gut 
all of the 14th and 15th Amendment. So he's basically saying from Reconstruction onwards, yeah. from the 1860s and 70s onwards, we should repeal all of that. And we should go back to the day, ironically, when black people have no rights and other racially disenfranchised minorities have no rights. And it's just the fact that, yes, it's only concurrence, but the fact that he's even putting this out there, yeah. what we see is a lot of times these radical concurrences they then become the thing that the lower courts pick up on, and then it goes back for the Supreme Court. Right. So don't ignore this, because this would be coming back soon rather than later. Well, it reminds me, Dahlia, of the Dobbs decision, where Thomas is suggesting gay marriage may be the next thing to fall. I mean, it's a, it's a matter of shifting the Overton window, moving the, field, the goalpost down the field and saying, oh, maybe we should rethink Brown. Now, that may not be the immediate impact of all of this, but it does sort of set a new goal for the right, does it not? It, it does, and it emboldens, as Ari says, lower court judges who are trying out constantly for the Supreme Court to be like, I'm going to read that, that that Thomas dissent as the majority opinion, and I'm going to write it into law and just take a big swing and see what happens. And we've got case after case this term at the Supreme Court that are born of that kind of zealotry. And I think the really important thing that Ari is saying and that we shouldn't miss is that today, like, it's easy to get hyper-focused on the flags and hyper-focused on the sort of intramural crazy happening at the court. But the court just eviscerated the Reconstruction Amendments for all intents and purposes. The court said that the amendments that promised a freer, fuller, participatory democracy are essentially unenforceable. And for us to sit around and be like, hmm, this can't go any farther. Clarence Thomas is pretty much telling us he's willing to take it farther. Just jump on and enjoy the ride. Repeal the 20th century from Clarence Thomas, justice on the Supreme Court. Ari Berman, Dahlia Lithwick, thank you for your time and your wisdom. I'm not going to say calming words because I'm more alarmed than I ever have been. But thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate you. Thank you.